My name is Erica Mildred, and I think I've met most of you by now um, since I'm serving as kind of the representative of the CCLE board who also happens to work here. Um, I'm the headmaster here and just wrapped up my first of 16 years. Um, I say 16 years because that's how long it will take my youngest to get through our entire program of 12th grade. So um, well, today we're going to talk about rhetorical figures in writing and speaking. I'm going to start by giving us a little bit of an overview of the five divisions of rhetoric. Um, the, the topic of rhetoric is something that could last in the conference um, and in terms of all of the wealth of knowledge. And before I get too far into this, I want to let everybody know that at the very end I will give you my email address. And if you email me, I would be happy to send you a copy of the presentation. Um, but the, uh, what I want to focus on is the third of the five divisions, but before we jump into that, I want to give you an overview of all five. So the first division of rhetoric is the uh, division of invention. Um, invention includes things such as proof. Um, they would include proof in artificial proof that would be evidence that you would be gathering for your case, be it a debate or a speech or a piece of writing. Um, also, there are artificial proofs. These are also known as the three Aristotelian appeals, pathos, logos, and ethos. Um, logos is the appeal to reason. Pathos is the appeal to the emotion. And ethos is the appeal to the speaker or the writer's credibility. Types of logos also fall within the category of invention. Um, there are two types. We have deductive, which um, includes syllogisms, Syllogisms are those things which are provably true, and enthymemes, those are things which are probably true. You also have inductive logos, which includes scientific, that's all instances are included. I'm so sorry, I will go with that. And, that better? Okay, good. And example, that means some instances are included. Um, of course, some of you, if you are math teachers, you've been exposed to deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning, of course, is leading um, from the large to the specific, and of course, inductive reasoning is when you start with a lot of examples and then kind of assume something, either scientifically if everything's included or um, just by way of examples and Invention continued also includes Aristotle's topoi. Topoi were topics, they were specific, special areas of knowledge. Um, those would be called idioi topoi, or arguments of all kinds, poinoi topoi. Those include what can or cannot happen, what has or has not happened, what will or will not happen, and such. So Aristotle came up with these. He actually came up with 28 of them that were useful in developing enthymemes. And he also came up with 10 invalid topoi. Those are also known as Aristotle's fallacies. And again, I'm putting all of this up here, and these are all great presentations for future topics at future CCLE, or if you are a teacher of rhetoric or a teacher of writing, things that you can dive into. At the very end of this presentation, I will also include where you can find more information on these things. The second, uh, oh, excuse me, we're still in invention. Um, also in the category of invention are the commonplaces. Those are topics that were given to uh, uh, orators as they were studying rhetoric um, to basically memorize and then be able to speak upon. Also, an invention was known as something known as stasis theory. This is uh, used in modern uh, forms of rhetoric and debate study today, but it actually also comes to us from antiquity. It was developed by Hermagoras of Chemnos around 150 BC. It basically means that you are going to phrase your debate or phrase your argument in such a way that one side is pro something and the other side is against that same thing. One of the reasons we struggle as Christians in the debate of abortion today is because it is not a debate that is in state. We say that we are pro-life, and they say they are pro-death, right? No, what do they say? They are pro-choice. That is not an argument in state. And so Hermogoras of Chemnos and others would have said, we can't even begin to have a debate here because we do not have a pro and a con side 
And so we aren't even able to begin our discussion of that. Moving on to the second division of rhetoric, and uh, for those of you who are just arriving, we are going to be focusing in just a couple minutes on the third division of rhetoric in this presentation, but before we do so, I'm trying to give a brief overview of all five divisions of rhetoric. Arrangement is the second division of rhetoric. There were various models used throughout antiquity of four, five, six, or eight plus that were promoted by various rhetoricians. Aristotle said there should be four, Quintilian said five, the author of Rhetorica Ad Herenium said six. Um, six is what has been studied uh, in the Renaissance ages, uh, even though um, you know, there is obviously quite a bit of debate about it. Um, and then, of course, some, such as Cicero, have, ar have argued as many as eight plus subparts within those parts. So the six parts of arrangement, which again were studied in the high Renaissance times, and we have kind of this same pattern today, are the exordium, where we get the audience's attention, narration, setting forth the main parts of your speech, division, stating your similarities and differences, between your case and the opposition, again, assuming that it was set in the basis to begin with, proof, why you're right, reputation, why they're wrong, and peroration, summarize. Thirdly, and we will get back to this in greater detail, is style. Third division of rhetoric is style. There are three types of style in formal classical rhetoric, low or plain style, middle style, and grand style. We analyze the type based on the importance of the topic, the diction, including the presence or absence of figures, the effect on the audience, the higher the emotional effect usually correlates with the higher the style, the syntax, which also, as you'll see in a little bit, uh, addresses rhetorical figures in the category of tropes. And Cicero also came up with four virtues to analyze style of the oration or the speech. Purity, which means correctness. Clarity. Decorum, how appropriate it was for the audience. And ornament, elegance. Elegance, again, was something that then went into the use of rhetorical figures and trust. So rhetorical figures, the presence thereof would be a major thing to look at when looking at all of these. And the two types of rhetorical figures we have are tropes and schemes. And I will, just, uh, for point of reference, we'll go over what tropes and schemes are in a minute once we finish the five divisions. The fourth division of rhetoric was memorization. There's natural, which means it comes easily, naturally, and usually because you're exposed to something frequently and repetitively over time. Like your name would be natural memory. You don't have to memorize it, you just know it. Things that you just know, but it actually is your brain's use of natural memorization. And of course, what we do in school and homeschool is primarily artificial memorization, that's the training of the mind. Finally, the fifth division of rhetoric was delivery. The point of the five divisions of rhetoric is really to show that all of these things were done by orators, by rhetoricians, prior to getting up and then delivering that speech. So they did, however, look at things like their voice techniques, their gesture techniques, what we would call verbal and nonverbal communication. Now into that third uh, division of rhetoric that we're going to focus on for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Whether you use these types of style or Cicero's virtues to analyze the speech, hopefully you notice that rhetorical figures were a vital part of analyzing what the style of a speech is. A figure is any device or pattern of language in which the meaning is enhanced or changed. And we have two subcategories of figures, tropes and themes. Tropes are words used to mean something other than their ordinary meaning. Anytime we take a word and play with its meaning and use it in not its normal, ordinary sense of the word, that is considered a figure of trope. Schemes, on the other hand, are words that preserve their literal meaning. However, 
They are placed in a significant arrangement of some kind, which draws attention to the word or phrase, or somehow heightens the style because of how it is used or arranged. There are also some large-scale tropes or schemes, or even combinations of both. For example, allegory, the entire category of the allegory is considered a large-scale trope. When and where to teach rhetorical figures? Um, you can use rhetorical figures in both written and oral communication. So in composition, um, classical composition, how many of you are familiar with classical composition by Selby? Um, he uses, uh, he teaches writing through the Proyemnus Mata. The Proyemnus Mata is a series of exercises that are found in the first division of rhetoric, the invention. And we use classical composition in grades 3 through 8. In ninth grade, we introduce to them 43 rhetorical figures, which they learn, we teach them, they memorize them, and then they use them in writing. In this grade, scholars are not taught where rhetorical fit into the division of rhetoric. We don't talk about the five divisions of rhetoric, and we say, okay, now this is the third division. We save that for when they study rhetoric. But we give them, starting in ninth grade, these figures to start using as tools to enhance their writing and oral communication. Then they study classical rhetoric on a formal level in either 11th or 12th grade for a full year. And rhetorical devices are again studied and used in written work, oratory, and debate. This time, scholars learn how rhetorical devices fit into the divisions of rhetoric and how rhetoricians throughout history have used them. So they're exposed to them twice, one on, if you will, even though they're both rhetoric, one on more of a grammatical level, right, a grammar level of learning and understanding vocabulary, terminology, and logic, how to use the fly. And then, secondly, on a rhetorical level, how to become beautifully eloquent, persuasive, and communicative in writing and in oral speech. All right, so what are the 43 rhetorical figures? First of all, rhetorical figures, they can be categorized and organized, as we said, into tropes, figures meaning, or into schemes, arrangements. What I do then is I subdivide these categories into smaller groups that emphasize function within composition and oratory in order to help scholars master and memorize them based on usage and functionality. These are the categories that I came up with to kind of subgroup these tropes and schemes. I have a group called balance and emphasis that has mostly schemes because it has to do with arrangement, making things in order or somehow not in order in a purposeful way to draw attention. Transition, clarity, and figurative language, those are mostly tropes. Syntax, mostly schemes. Restatement, mostly tropes. Sounded drama, a combination of both. And wordplay, mostly schemes. Each figure of scholar studies is taught to them in three parts. I'm going to share all 43 that I use. Those are certainly by no means a, an exhaustive list. Um, and then I'm also going to share with you how I teach them to my students. I give them the name of the figure. In a few cases, there are two names. I give them the definition. And then I give them samples, several samples, of the figure used in composition or in oratory. And with that, I try to give them a combination of two things. I first try to find some famous works or speeches. If I can pull from the Bible, I do so because I love to help them see how the Bible is not just truth, and it's not just God's word. It certainly is those things, but it is beautiful literature. It is beautiful writing and oratory. Well, I guess not oratory, but beautiful written work. I also come up, though, with my own to show them how to use the figure in modern language and context, and, of course, to demonstrate that I'm not going to ask them to do anything that I myself am not going to do. I have my scholars copy down every example. They do not have a choice. And I have 
have them use different colors, uh, using different color pencils or pens to visually highlight the figure. I have them do it on flashcards, okay, so that then they have something that they can study off of. Scholars are expected to memorize the names, definitions, and examples for quiz to protect. Uh, they not only have to say what uh, metonymy connecting is in a definition sort of setting, but I may give them the example on, from that note card that they have, and they have to say what that is an example of. They have to be able to go both ways with them. They're also expected to show mastery by using them in original compositions of teaching. Okay, so here are some sample rhetorical figures. And I will show you how I do that even with the color scheme. So the first one I picked out for you, and these are, if it says figure one, that's the first one I teach the fourth grade I'm talking. So figure number one is parallelism. I start with parallel structure. The definition is words, phrases, or sentences of similar construction and meaning placed side by side, balancing each other. So then I give them the first example from the Bible, Corinthians 13:13. 13, 13. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And I point out to them, here is an example of three words in parallel structure. It's not just about the fact that you have things in some sort of order with commas correctly in between them, but um, each of them is balanced in terms of the fact that each of them is one word long. The second example I give them are three phrases. Notice there are three phrases coupled with an infinitive followed by a prepositional phrase. When I teach this in English grammar composition in ninth grade, we have already covered parts of speech, parts of the sentence, so things like direct objects, indirect objects, and prepositional phrases, and we've covered the five phrases including verbal. So that way when I get to this and I show them, look at how this is in parallel structure and I talk about the infinitive and I talk about the prepositional phrases, they know what I'm talking about. And finally, I give them an example of three subordinate conjunctions in parallel structure. Here's where you can go also into anywhere in writing in the real world and find blatant uh, misuses of parallelism. In other words, places where parallel structure is broken. You can even use that as an assignment for your students once they really understand this to go and find an example in writing somewhere where there is no parallel structure, where you start with to live in peace, to serve in joy, and God are my goals in life. You know, somewhere where the parallel structure is broken, it's almost always broken on that third one, although sometimes you can find writing where each set does not match. Um, this is also, the more complicated you get, like this is a series, series of three words, not very complicated, series of three subordinate conjunctions that's very complicated in terms of writing. So the more complicated it is, the more likely you're going to find it misused in modern writing. So the third one, that prejudice exists is true, that sin remains a part of me is undeniable, but that I use these as excuses for bigotry is inexcusable. Okay, figure number two, chiasmus. Chiasmus is two corresponding pairs arranged not in parallel but in inverted order. I'm going to pause there for a minute. I just thought of something else I wanted to say about this. There are so many things that you can do with this and depending on your level of student, how much they've already been exposed to in writing, how quickly you want to go through rhetorical figures. You could spend, I spend about, I spend about a quarter on rhetorical figures. We take about half the quarter getting through them and doing quizzes and making sure they have them down. And then we use the second quarter to really uh, fine tune them in their writing and, and have them give me writing assignments, which of course takes time to put them in there. But there are so many other things you can do with this then. I gave you the example of going into the real world and finding misuses of them. That would be one thing you could do. Having them just in class sit there and try to write their own example, having them model from like biblical work or other famous writings, um, that's another thing that, that Jim Selby does with his Prometheus Mata, and it's definitely a classical technique that they use in um, rhetoric is you copy from the great masters. So you find great masters that are wonderful at using parallelism, and then you model after them. Okay, chiasmus. So chiasmus also creates balance 
Um, it's also in this arrangement category, but it is two corresponding pairs arranged not in parallel, but in inverted order. So they're not matching, but they're not matching on purpose. Okay, examples of this one. Those gallant men will remain often in my thoughts, adverb, prepositional phrase, and in my prayers always, prepositional phrase, adverb, Renowned for conquest and in council skill, participial phrase, prepositional phrase, part of, uh, prepositional phrase, participial. His time a moment and his appoints his face. Alexander Pope. One of the things I notice as you teach these to students is they get really excited about the meaning and the, the intentionality of words. Not just in their own writing to become better at that, but in terms of their listening to things that are spoken, uh, things that are written for them that they're reading, they start picking these things up. Because, especially the great writers of the past had these tools, and not only do they have them in their arsenal, but they use them frequently. So it develops an appreciation for great writing and great oratory as well. Okay, moving on a few figures. Figure six is asymmetric. I debated back and forth to give you asymmetric or polysymmetric, but if you get one, you get them both. Asymmetric is a lack of coordinating conjunction between words, phrases, or clauses. So coordinating conjunctions are usually ands or buts or fors. Usually one of those three in asymmetric or polysymmetric. And polysymmetric is almost always e. So, JFK, we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, <coughs> oppose any foe. Notice there's no and and there's no or. It's a citizen, a lack of and. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground, Abraham Lincoln. Here we have two presidents, very different uh, philosophies in terms of um, conservative, liberal, sort of uh, political positions, but both were master rhetoricians. Both were master orators. And both knew how to use and utilize the formal figure symbol. Uh, so, just even though we're not covering it, figure seven is polysynthesis. That means many and. If we have time at the end, I'll pull that one back up because the example I found is really good. Alright, figure 16, catacresis. Catacresis is a harsh metaphor involving the use of a word beyond its strict sphere. By the time I got to this one, I would like to, sometimes I would challenge the students to see if they could even come up with something, especially if the definition is kind of eluding or confusing. So I'd like to come up with something, like can you come up with an example of catacresis? What does that mean? A harsh metaphor. We've already covered metaphor, because I know that it's compared to two things about using like that. A harsh metaphor involving use of a word beyond a strict sphere. And so, just to have a little fun today, can any of you, I know you haven't had, you haven't gone through all 16 and so forth, but can anyone come up with kind of an example of that? Well, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are whitewashed sepulchres, looking beautiful on the outside and inside, filled with them and the stone. Um, MacArthur, I like using MacArthur, he, he gave great speeches. I listen vainly, but with thirsty ears. Ears are thirsty. And yet here we have a description of one of the parts of our body that appeals to our senses, but the wrong sense, or a misuse of the But what does that mean that he has a thirsty ear? Yes, he wants to hear. So, so we use catechesis to really express that meaning uh, even more uh, more plainly, if you will, than if we just said, uh, I listen vainly, but intensely, right? It wouldn't communicate as much. Milton, blind mouth, blind mouth that scarce know themselves know how to hold a sheep hook or have learned aught else to leave. Back to the faithful person's part. And then I gave some other examples um, to my students. The foot of a hill. We have lots to really think about this. 
the neck of a guitar, the toe of a golf club. Um, I'm going to, at the end, pass around some of um, my students' writing last year that I asked then her to use these in her own writing. But she used, she kind of copied, which is great. She said, um, no, my eyes are thirsty to see my favorite place, which is enchanted with wonderful things to touch and see and smell. It is truly a place to call home. And then this was a paper about home and an essay around that. But I love that she took writing from the great masters of old and then incorporated that in her. Um, next one, the autonomy, the next key. Every year my students ask me, why are there two names? And every year I say, I'm not quite sure. We had two names. Maybe we have two names to name things quite frequently, right? Where we name something, or we can call it, we can call it Kleenex, or we can call it tissue. Um, but either one, it is, the definition is substitution of one word for another which it suggests. This is also a very complicated one, or a very complex one. Some examples, he is a man of the cloth. We, of course, are talking about pastors, right? But it's not, we don't say that. It's, it's implying that through a use of another word. The pen is mightier than the sword. That's two of them right there. The pen represents, small thing that represents writing in general, is mightier than the sword, representing physical conflict or um, dominance through violent means. By the sweat of thy brow, right, our eyebrows are too long. Um, thou shalt eat thy bread, hopefully more than just. The U.S. won three gold medals. The man bought 50 head of cattle. There's a lot of fun we can have with rhetorical devices as well. And of course, even in the Lord's Prayer itself, give us this day our daily bread. We certainly, by this, how does it go in the catechism? Certainly not just daily bread, right? That's right. <laughs> so here's 22, epithet. Epithet is an adjective or phrase expressing an attribute of a person, and then the phrase becomes the name for that person. Some examples of this, and then I have to share with you um, something that happened in a recent conference I attended. Uh, Richard the Lionhearted, Louis the Twelfth was the father of the people. A lot of times he was just called the father of the people. We all knew who we were talking about. Alexander the Great. Uh, Yankee is actually a Cherokee epithet meaning coward. Um, when I was at um, I was at the International Center and I was attending a uh, conference for new uh, administrators that's put on by the uh, LCMS. Um, there was an associate Petrock professor of history there um, who wrote a book about George Washington. Um, he's teaching up at Beckwon, and he wrote it about his character and about how George Washington was truly a, uh, not just uh, sentimentally religious, but a devout religious Christian. And unlike some of his counterparts, such as Thomas Jefferson, um, George Washington, um, he signed, um, as was practice of say for his church, he signed that he would um, face death rather than fall away from the teachings of the church. It also required him to be there for the and so forth and so on. Um, but the arguments, he talked about how um, modern culture and revisionist historians are trying to paint this picture of George Washington that he wasn't very religious or that we really don't know if he was Christian or not. And one of the points that they, the, the revisionist historians, point that is that George Washington rarely, in his writing, talks about Jesus or to name how just said God. He rarely says those things in his writing, so therefore, he religious. But when you dig into George Washington's writings, what you find is that George Washington refers to God as uh, the maker and provider of all things. And maker is capitalized, provider is capitalized. Um, our, our, our ever faithful <coughs> providence. He uses epithet after epithet to name God. 
And that wasn't just something that George Washington did, but it was something that the religious of the time did, and certainly the classically educated did in general as they wrote. Uh, George Washington, of course, didn't think, well, 200 years from now, they're going to be wondering if I'm a Christian or not, because that's what Jesus did. Right? So he just referred to God in that exalted language and style using epithet quite frequently. Figure 23, another one that has two names, Wegma Solicitus, and it also, fortunately for the students, has two definitions, and they, of course, have to learn epithet. So definition number one is two different words arranged with a verb or an adjective that is strictly appropriate only to one of them. So for example, neither rain nor shine shall postpone our height. Shine does not postpone your height, and yet it is combined with um, rain and shine for postpone. Not more, excuse me, not Mars his sword, nor wars quick fires shall burn the living record of your memory. Burning is only associated with one of those two. Nor God nor I delight in perjured men. Uh, this one is grammatical. So we have a neither God nor I delight. Um, delight is singular and yet you're saying both of them do not delight. So that's only grammatical uh, <coughs> example of Swayman Philippus. Tears and sighs poured out of her eyes. Keep your comments and your thoughts to yourself. His eyes and ears were watching. And here's where we kind of have a blending of Wegmas, Lipsis, and Taxus that we've covered before. The sheep and their shepherd, ever watchful for the evil wolf, I came up with this one this week, raised in the pasture. Okay. It also checks to make sure I'm, you know, sit there so with me. Mm -hmm. All right, definition number two. Two words used differently in the same sentence. So here, Ben Franklin was uh, well known for his use of the second definition of way of We have, we all must hang together or assuredly we will all hang separately. You better fire up, or the box will fire you. <coughs> the item was definitely a steel, since the boy chose to steal it. He threw the pitch, and with it, threw the game. A few more, and then I'll show you all 43 that we use, and then open it up for some uh, comments and thoughts that you may have. Um, anastrophe. This is inverted word order for effect. When I teach this one, um, I tell my students to think Yoda. And I even say anastrophe. I don't say it well, but I try. So this is this is how Yoda was taught. He was a master of anastrophe. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up flew. What's being the word order? Very well I am doing today. Figure 27, anaphora, the, the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of successive phrases, clauses, or lines. Some of the famous war speeches or general speeches have a plethora of anaphora. We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall never surrender. I even didn't include them all. Sir Lancelot, thou wert never matched the earthly knight's hand, and thou wert the courteous knight that ever bare shield, and thou wert the truest friend. I have the and in green because that's also an example of Holly Syndicate. Yes. Simplicity. This is one of my favorites. I love simplicity. Simplicity is the repetition of different words in successive sentences in the same order and in the same sense. It's a blend of a trope and a scene. Example, what is popular is not always right, and what is right is not always popular. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this one. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. And, from 623. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life 
through Christ Jesus our Lord. I love talking about this in the students. We have wages paired up rhetorically with gifts. We have sin paired up rhetorically with God. And we have death paired up rhetorically with eternal life. Figure 30 and the focus. This is the repetition of the last word of one clause at the beginning of the next clause. As you are singing hymns on Sunday, look for and the focus is used quite frequently in our hymns and our hymns. Um, here's an example from Milton. I think this unfrequented place to find some ease, ease to the body, song, none to the mind. So it's a repetition of the word, one at the end of the line and then one at the beginning of the next line. Then in great place are Christ's servants, servants of the sovereign or state, servants of fame, and servants of wisdom. Notice the anaphora as well. The uh, repetition of the same word in the same sentence, uh, same sense for emphasis. This is where poets go to yell. Break, break, break on thy cold gray stone, O C. O C is not one that we covered, but it's personification. Oh, and oh, apostasy, sorry, apostasy. But the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And of course, Daniel, God likes to do this. Uh, 39, Ephesus. This is an, students like this one. This is an insinuating and an accusation while on the surface protesting to deny it. Yes. <laughs> Not this by no means that I bid you do. Let the blood king come to you to bed. Again, that's Hamlet when he's talking to his mother, and his mother's trying to explain the fact that she was okay with marrying her uh, husband's brother. Please, by all means, continue with your Who am I to judge if you choose to lie in the husband? Be my guest. Feel free to cheat it. All right, here are. Um, the rhetorical figures that we use at MLCX in order. When I assign written and oratory assignments, um, I do them as we're studying different groups of figures. And then I require very specific. I require them how many to include, which ones to include. They'll get their own free choices later on. The first time I want them to practice, um, I'm going to see a wrong with the kindergarten teacher. She says practice makes permanent. And even at the, the highest levels of our students, we want to make sure that they have it down permanently. Um, they are required to use it properly. They are required to label them. I prefer color codes. You can certainly have them label it any way you want. After they demonstrate mastery, then I have them use a specific number of any figures they want throughout the rest of the year. So they never get to say, and I finished with the circle cycle. They have to keep using them and using them. What's nice about this, though, is after they master them all, they're going to find one, like I like them to teach. I think it's an amazing big teach. They're going to find their favorite. And they're not just going to find them because they're the easy ones <coughs> to do. Oftentimes, you will find that your scholars will pick the ones that are difficult because they just belong on to the ones that just raise their writing to that next level. Um, so I have some samples. Um, I, the one is highlighted only because I wanted to draw your attention to it as we were talking about that research. I'm just going to pass them around. All three of the essay examples that I have there were allowed to be written. They had to be written formally, with the exceptions of they could have been done, they could be done in first person, and she was allowed to use um, apostrophes and contractions, uh, for, for contractions, uh, simply because this is still early on in the year. It's October and November um, of the year. Later on, I get more technical and have them write more formally. Um, conclusion, the 43 figures, they are by no means the extent of figures available. There are literally hundreds of rhetorical figures at your students' disposal for you to share with them. 
teachers of composition and oratory should select figures that have ample usage and examples from classical works and speeches that fit with the scope and sequence and curricular choices of their school or home school, and that provide scholars with the tools with which to improve their composition and oratory. Obviously, as you partner with uh, either your administration, your personal city, um, your husband or wife, if you're homeschooling, whoever it is that decides what you want to do with these, um, you can decide how many and to what extent to dive into them. I have never had a problem with any ninth grader at any school I have taught, regardless of previous exposure, to be able to do this. Um, as I promised, these are further reading and resources for you where you can find things that I have mentioned and talked about. Um, Aristotle's rhetoric is a great first tool or first place to start if you want to get more information on rhetoric in general or specifically the third division of style. Cicero's Rhetorica Ad Herenium is really great. Um, book four is where he lists figures. Cicero's De Inventione is book one. You'll want to look at book one. That's where he discusses stasis. That's still part of invention in the first vision. Um, but stasis is really, I think stasis is something that you should definitely teach your students early and often. Because when they get to that point where they get frustrated because they want to argue and their friends are coming at them with a, a liberal, progressive mindset, and they don't, they don't even know it was like, I feel like I'm just, we're just talking past each other. It's probably because they are talking past each other because the argument is not the basis. And the basis is this, that the argument, the I will happily discuss this with you, but we have to get to the basis first. First of all, they already have the upper hand because they're the only one that knows what basis is. And secondly, once you get it in basis, logic coupled with great rhetorical skill always wins out. The truth is out. But the truth can't have a, it doesn't have a fair fight because you're, you're talking here and they're talking here. So you're never able to go anywhere. Um, Quintilian, uh, Quintilian's book three discusses stasis. Books 13 and nine, I don't know, or eight, excuse me, sorry. I don't eight and nine discuss tropes and figures and then book 10 discusses writing. Um, there's my email address at the bottom. We have uh, approximately 12 minutes left um, that we can uh, discuss more anything you want about rhetoric, anything that you want about figures, what you do in your writing program. Yeah, question. Yeah. It, it seems like, you know, seeing those examples, some of them are really pushing the boundaries of grammar as we find it and whatnot. Do you run across in that class where the students, their brains are just kind of sort of fried a little bit? They are processing these figures and whatnot with some of the rules that they've learned and this stuff is really pushing or maybe even exceeding the boundaries. How do you deal with that? Well, the first thing is that they're noticing what rule is being broken. That's fantastic. Yeah. Great writers, great orators, and, and honestly, I think the first thing you do, let me back up for a minute. If you're talking, because many of my examples were speeches, okay, there is a difference between written word and spoken word. Um, what you write down and and how they punctuated it 150 years ago for the purpose of a speech does not necessarily follow the written grammatical rules of say. And that's okay. And I think we just help students see that. Well, first of all, we know that, and what is, sorry, I'm getting, I, I kind of go all over the place. One of the reasons we teach Latin is because it is a dead language, right? But yes, right. One of the reasons we teach Latin is because it is a dead language. Its rules do not change. Spoken languages, the rules of grammar, the rules of syntax, the rules of morphology, they all change over time because we are speaking it. We don't say some verbs right now the way verbs were said 100 years ago because as we speak it, language changes over time. One of the reasons we teach Latin is because it gives us that grammatical, uh, understanding of language that isn't going to change or fluctuate. So when you come up with and you look at it as an example of Plato or even Bacon or Milton and they have a comma where they shouldn't have a comma 
or they have a um, it, they have a fragment, what we would call it a fragment, it seems like it's just fine, it's just a great work of writing. We have to look at the fact that in context, those will change over time. Um, for those of you who are grammarians at heart, who love English grammar, I'm one of those, um, there are kind of two camps, right? The prescriptive grammarians who say rules matter, there are set rules and you follow them. The descriptive, which falls more into that progressive camp that says, oh, well, you know, um, just as long as you get close. I'm, of course, in this camp, but I also recognize that any language that is spoken, this camp is going to move. You can still be prescriptive, but the rules are going to change. We have the same thing in um, sports today, right? Even basketball. I played basketball. How you can line up a free throw line has changed, okay? It doesn't mean that players uh, in my day or players today can then say, well, that's not how it was back then. The rules changed, but it's a rule now. You follow the rules now, but you can still help students see how the rules changed in the past. Um, the Oxford comma is a great conversation, kind of off topic, but that is a great conversation to have with your students about an example of how a rule changes over time. Back and then forth and then back again and then forth again. Some of you are smiling, others of you are just looking at me. Uh, if you want it, Ray, I can talk to you about the Oxford comma. Yes? Uh, I was also going to say, I think sometimes the things we take from the rules and grammar are really issues of style. And so, some of these, correct me if I'm wrong, the way I've read Yes. Absolutely. And great masters of both writing and oratory, uh, they would not say that they break rules as much as they bend them. I always tell students, as soon as you can show me that you have mastered the understanding of the rule and then you can defend why you bent it here, you go ahead and do that. Okay, that's that's a great that, that shows true understanding and competence and purposefulness for why the way you work. Thank you. Yeah. I was going, going back to uh, figures, uh, a lot of these figures, uh, it's a very small writing in the green, it's just for whatever. Do you find that these figures don't work so well in English because of the difference in the grammar? The 43 that I picked fit well, very well in English, and I found the examples of them throughout history being used. Um, this is part of the reason I picked them. There are more than 43 out there then that also fit into that category, but there are some that just, um, you're right, wouldn't really fit into our modern way of communication. It would, instead of enhancing the communication and ornamenting it, it would muddle it and um, just kind of um, downplay it or make it confusing. It's a great point. And this gives for students a chance to be intentional. If you, after learning the, a certain group of rhetorical figures, and you know, I, I always do the quizzes first, I always make sure they understand the definitions and so forth, but then you give them a writing assignment and you say, you have to do this, 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 and this. These are examples to help you. You have to do one on your own, your own original. Now they have to do it. They have to break or bend the rule, and they have to be intentional. So it gives them freedom to do that. It gives them permission to do that, and also challenges. Yes. The cost uh, composition grade is that come into play? This is a great question. Um, for our third and fourth grade classes, they are um, <coughs> one teacher for most of the day with with a few special classes. When we get up to fifth grade, we have our students combine fifth, sixth, and then they kind of move to the teachers and specialty. Um, and so the schedule upstairs doesn't really fit the same as the schedule downstairs. I thought I had a third grade teacher. I, um, I think that third and fourth grade do it three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, I will tell you that um, I talked to Jim Selby last summer when he was at our conference, and he said third grade, it depends on the class like they might be ready for it. It depends on what you're doing to lead up to third grade. Are most of those kids coming through your program or are most of them transferred? He 
said, it's just going to depend. So what we decided to do, because last year we just implemented it, is third grade and fourth grade use the same book. Book one is disabled. And they do the odd, one does the odds and then one does the even. And so they're going to get fables for two years. We still are um, trying to uh, reestablish our kind of base in terms of our enrollment to get more steady. And so it also benefits us for that reason because we are still a school that has quite a few transfers that are coming in in those early years. Um, upstairs, um, we have uh, Brittany Newton does our fifth grade through eighth grade. So she does classical composition, and I believe she does it still three days a week, but it might be two. Um, if any of you see Brittany, come on to do that. Thank you. 